a biblical perspective on life, culture and current events. This is 2020 on Vision. The conversation, which who knows where it'll go. We could be in the deep end. It could be quite controversial and you might like to have your say and you can prepare to do that. We won't open our talk back lines just yet, but shortly we will. No doubt there's lots of mixed sentiments that follow the events of the church terror attack earlier this week, where a 16-year-old young man allegedly stabbed ministers of the Assyrian Orthodox Church of the Good Shepherd in Wakerley in Sydney. The Assyrian Christians are highly sensitive to church assaults because many reportedly have come to Australia in efforts to escape the murderous terror group Islamic State. Half a million Christians were displaced from Iraq and Syria in those years, and they are no strangers to persecution. So the question today begs itself, what would you do if your church came under terror attack? The Jewish community has been fearful of Islamic anti-Semitism since protests at the Sydney Opera House after the October 7th Hamas massacre of Israeli Jews. Now Christian churches are also demonstrably in the sights of extremist Islam. Both Jews and Christians are grouped together as the people of the book. And our special guest today has helped to provide training and protection for faith-based communities for several years. Dr. Gavriel Schneider is a leader in the field of human-based risk management and the psychology of risk. He's the CEO of Risk2 Solution Group. It's Australia's most awarded integrated risk management solutions provider. He's the creator of the concept of resilience, which enabled his business to be recognised as among Australia's most innovative companies. He's Australia's most awarded cyber and physical integrated risk business. And Dr. Gav is author of the highly acclaimed Can I See Your Hands? A Guide to Situational Awareness, Personal Risk Management, Resilience and Security. And just to top things off, might I say, he's a lifelong martial artist holding several high grades, including a 7th degree black belt in Krav Maga and Jiu Jitsu. Gav, let me say a special welcome along to 2020. Thank you and thanks for having me. Gav, let me just start with this. I mean, these uh, very, very significant skills that you have and uh, highly recognised in the field of criminology as well. Coupling that with your Jewish heritage, give us an insight here because the Jewish people are no strangers to terrorism from all sides. Uh, What is it that really motivates you? So I started training in martial arts when I was five years old. I was a very sickly child and really fell in love with the idea that we can make ourselves stronger and develop a good physical and mental capability. When I finished high school, I grew up in South Africa. My year was the year that conscription actually ended. And I did intend to go to the military as a martial artist. It seemed like a good idea. Uh, instead, I actually landed up in Israel. And I was a living student of a guy by the name of Dennis Hanover, who's considered the godfather of Israeli martial arts. When I went back to South Africa, I then started working as a professional bodyguard while I did my academic studies and really found the idea of protecting things and people as my primary motivator. And it's probably my biggest passion behind probably everything I do. Uh, let me ask you about Krav Maga. Um, that's a martial arts that I'm not so familiar with. How do you describe it? So Krav Maga actually is an Israeli translation for the term contact combat. And it was a system originally developed by uh, its founder, Imi, many years ago as a basic system of military combat. Uh, so soldiers were all trained in Krav Maga. And originally it was really more designed for if your weapon jammed or if you were in a tight spot. But over the years, it's evolved to be a full-blown martial art. Um, the, the system I train is actually in Hebrew. It's called Hisadut, which means survival. And it's actually a system that evolved to be Israel's only recognized style of jiu-jitsu and was a system designed for the counter-terror units. So it's slightly tougher and a little more contact-based. And you know, from my perspective, being able to defend yourself is the starting point of any security posture. If you can't protect yourself, how do you protect your sight? So Krav Maga, let me get the pronunciation right. And just to dwell for a moment, because you have trained uh, Israeli uh, defence forces uh, in this art as well. 
Well, I, be, I was an instructor at the main centre in Herzliya where many soldiers train. I've never been a, employed by the idea for the Israeli government in any way, shape or form. But since 1996, I've travelled to Israel almost every year to take students to train or to grade or to teach myself. So it's, a, it's an ongoing journey. And so defending yourself from physical attack, uh, this is where I just want to draw attention to this today. And there might be listeners who might be thinking, uh, is this really the way that Christians conduct themselves? And uh, there might be a question around defence and attack. And of course, we're talking about defence, of course, uh, in the context that we are here. But the thought that somehow or other we need to be prepared to defend ourselves. And if we're talking Old Testament and New Testament, Certainly the Old Testament, there's no doubt at all, is there, about uh, the need for self-defense? Well, it's, it's really interesting. Um, I've served as uh, head of the Queensland Jewish community as a volunteer providing security. I did that for 10 years. I'm still an advisor to them. And when you look at faith-based protection, it's significantly different to almost any other type of protection. And to your point, uh, particularly from a Jewish faith perspective, you know, if I, if I look at the feedback we've received from the rabbis, for example, you know, the, the view is really that you know God gave us the ability to protect ourselves. We need to own it, and we need to make sure we do. And we have the capability. If we don't do it, whose failure is that? There is a thought that, uh, well, if you don't prepare, uh, you're leaving yourself open. Um, what are your thoughts on being prepared? I mean, I think uh, listeners will already know you're about to say, yes, be prepared. Some will be saying, well, you know, don't we leave that up to law enforcement authorities, but they're not going to be there in the event that there is an attack that happens imminently. Exactly right, Neil. And it's, it's fascinating. So, I, again, starting my career in South Africa, I've worked in about 17 countries so far doing everything from training presidential protection teams to full-blown corporate and governmental consulting on security and risk. And what's always fascinating to me is those who think they are spending too much time and effort on security usually are the ones who realize too late that they should have spent more. And it's one of those things, you know, an, an ounce of preparation is worth a ton of cure. You don't need to be paranoid. In fact, being paranoid is worse than being aware and we can talk about how that works, but a basic level of preparation is actually the best form of deterrence. So if you don't want something bad to happen, by being prepared, you minimize the likelihood of ever having to do something in response to a bad thing happening. Gav, let me ask you about your perceptions about Monday night's attack on the Church of the Good Shepherd at Wakerley in Sydney. Uh, Lots of us might have seen footage on television, Um, When you're a security risk expert like yourself, what are you seeing when you're looking at that footage and the way that that church conducted themselves uh, when there was the threat? Um, It's really important to not just focus on the actual incident, but we need to look at the the precursor events that lead up to that incident. Um, Having researched this for a long time, my PhD looked at how do we train people to respond under pressure in the most effective way to violence. And I interviewed many, many stakeholders, spent a lot of time in the U.S. looking at what works and obviously combining the experiences I'd had in Africa and Israel. And to your point, if you look at how that worked, firstly, we need to understand that there's an ongoing process of radicalization that is happening repeatedly. And just because we had COVID and just because we have other things happening doesn't mean it's not continuous. And, you know, going back to probably 2017, 2018, when Al-Qaeda was still very prominent, they were publishing their own glossy magazine called Insight Magazine that used to actually provide guidance on how to commit attacks using a knife, for example, or how to make homemade bombs. It's gotten way more sophisticated through COVID because online radicalization and the way we prepare people to commit attacks has become far more sophisticated and broader scale. So the challenge we've got is we've got people who are trained and motivated and it's easy for them to get the knowledge. We also can't ignore the fact that to a degree, there's a copycat element here. We saw what happened in Bondi. We saw the success of a knife attack. And it's highly likely that that created a level of confidence for the assailant. Okay. And of course, they were separate attacks. And one is being framed, of course, around an issue of severe mental health challenges. And the other one certainly is identified as a terror attack. Let me ask you about Australians and what you've observed since you've been in Australia, because uh, you mentioned uh, your South African and Jewish heritage and uh, in Israel. 
Um, where are we at in Australia? Because in in those countries uh, that you have been preparing yourself in, uh, there's a much different environment to here. How do you make an observation about Aussies and our thoughts about self-defence? Really good question. We could probably spend an hour just on that. But practically, Australia is incredible. If I look at many of the other places that I've been, you know, I'm so grateful my family is here because even though we've had two violent incidents in a week, you know, yesterday I was on a webinar and I, I just thought, let me Google what the, the, the murder rate is in South Africa and see what it is today. And it was 37 per day reported. So Australia comparatively is still safe. And we need to remember that when we plan for any sort of incident. The challenge we do have, though, is that for many years we've had what is often referred to as saltwater insulation. We're an island. We're far away. We're a small population. We're a comparatively wealthy country. And it's led to what I often refer to as she'll be all right risk management. It's okay. It'll be all right. Or the authorities will take care of it for us. Or somebody else needs to look after me. And that doesn't work anymore. Exactly to the point you raised earlier where we, we are blessed in Australia that we have competent law enforcement and intelligence agencies, but we don't have enough people to be everywhere all the time. We have to take a layer of responsibility, and I think there's a significant shift that's required in the way we collaborate, work with law enforcement. And if you think about this from a, a place of worship, something that is fundamentally meant to be open and pure, it does create a little bit of cognitive dissonance. But realistically, if we want to create a stable, safe place for people to be able to lose themselves in prayer and feel welcome, we need a layer of protection to ensure that happens. So there is a fine line. Of course, we would want our authorities to be available and law enforcement to do its job well and to be available and to make sure that these sorts of scenarios don't develop. Uh, but I guess today the conversation is around uh, what happened on Monday night. Uh, there was no warning that this attack would come. And, uh, you know, I've, I've, I've just grappled knowing that we're going to have this conversation just over this last 24 hours. Uh, the thoughts of, uh, are we jumping the gun here? Is this premature talking about this? But perhaps, as you say, Gav, um, preparation. Uh, vigilance is going to be a key. And so sowing some seeds today in some sense. So let me ask you about the sort of scenario. I mean, uh, the listener who's in our conversation today, listening to us, their church has an attacker come through the door. Maybe they're holding a knife. Maybe they're holding a gun. But you can sense that their motivation is sinister and they want to do harm. Uh, Take us into a scenario here. What would be the ideal response? Okay, so the ideal response is to make sure you're never put in the position to respond, right? The ideal response is to create a way of vetting who comes in and controlling who has access to your facility. Now, this is a simple thing to say in theory. It's very hard to do in practice, particularly for places of worship that in many cases, for example, their status is based on the fact that they allow people in. And their permission or licensing often requires them to be open. The challenge fundamentally is if you don't have an advanced plan, a way to respond, then the response is random. And we saw that with the attack the other night. Why the mob ensued post that was the lack of preparation and the sheer anger that something like that happened to a leader of the community in a place that was considered safe. So I think we need to be very careful before we actually go we are safe to make sure we are safe if we talk about the before phase so the before phase would generally have this idea of let's gather information intelligence report it to the police and hopefully they would respond ahead of time to mitigate something happening the next phase would be as somebody potentially suspicious arrives at your facility if you can get a structure in place where there's trained competent people and these don't have to be you know the, the elite of law enforcement or security an hour or two of training, you know what to look for in terms of somebody looking nervous, looking suspicious, potentially being able to conceal a weapon. There are a bunch of things that when you can identify those, if you can stop it at the door, it's significantly better than when you let it into the facility. Once it's inside, the challenge is we we actually feel safe. So we stop looking. So vigilance drops. So the idea is to have as many layers as possible before you get to that point of no return. Ideally, if you also have a group of people within your facility, within your church, your parish, it really doesn't matter how broad you go, 
that take responsibility for the security and safety. Um, in many of the churches we've worked with, often we'll use the ushers who already volunteer to help guide people to their seats and be of assistance who are already vigilant, and we'll train them up in response. So perception is part of the deterrence. If a potential attacker who was scoping out the possibility of attacking you knew that you had layers of Uh, ways that you are able to discern their own motive, uh, that perception is itself a very good deterrence. Gav, I know that this is... um, Some people will say, just tell me how I should deal with these guys who may have us in their sights. Uh, But you like to talk about a balance between this prevention that we've begun to talk about and how you might respond in the crisis. Getting that balance is going to be an important thing, isn't it? Absolutely. And that, getting that balance right is the balance between making sure we don't waste resources by being too paranoid as opposed to being unprepared. And to your point, the idea behind resilience, the concept we drive, is proactive prevention. But it's also opportunity centrism. And I would be thinking now, while we never want to be looking at stopping violence or crime as an opportunity, what we should be doing is going, if we can get our structures right, people will be safer. And we can potentially help those who require help. So I think there's an important differentiator here between terrorism and mental health issues. But from the point of view of a church wanting to keep its people safe, it actually doesn't matter the motivation of the attacker. What matters is what are they doing? And we've got to really make sure we've got a robust way of A, preventing, B, preparing, C, responding, and lastly, recovering from an attack. I have seen some uh, prevention measures. Uh, I had the privilege of visiting Cairo in Egypt. And when I went to church in Cairo, uh, I went through a metal detector uh, because there was a prevention measure there. Um, There was also another church that I went to, which was a Coptic Orthodox church. And uh, they had 300 men on a roster who would scour the streets uh, block after block around their church looking for any sort of bombs or suspicious activity so that they could report that back. Those sorts of things seem extreme to us here in Australia, and uh, and they certainly are, because I'm not saying that this is something that as Australians we need to be doing yet. But this prevention, that going through the metal detector is a reminder, isn't it, to everyone to be vigilant. There's a scale here, because you can only do what you can do with what you have. So, you know, while in a best case scenario, you would do as many things as you could to become an unattractive target for people who wanted to hurt you and to protect the people who want to be there. Um, what, what we found actually is well-motivated volunteers who actually care can get tremendous results without spending a lot of money. And I can give you an example of one synagogue we worked with, which was mainly made up of people older than 60. We, and the budget was very tight. We landed up asking for a bunch of volunteers. We got 10 people who volunteered all above the age of 70. Nonetheless, they were able to raise a bit of money, put up a CCTV camera, divide into shifts, and every Friday and Saturday night when that synagogue operated, they had somebody monitoring the cameras, monitoring the gates, and they went from absolutely vulnerable to pretty secure, and it cost them, I think, in total about $10,000. So it's not a big deal if you really are committed to making it work. So CCTV cameras uh, that are obvious there when you're coming to the entrance of your church, uh, these are the sorts of things that become a very good deterrent because at least in that sense, if someone's going to attack, they will know that it's all caught on camera. It depends on the motive of the attacker. So if we look at terrorism and even mental health, CCTV is not a deterrent because particularly even if we look at the attack that happened Uh, just the other night, realistically, that attacker intended to either die or be captured. There there was no way he was getting out of there, and he knew it. So arguably, when we start looking at people whose ideology links to martyrdom, it's a significantly different approach. And we we do have to have a worst-case scenario response in mind. While it's unlikely we deal with that, I mean, a lot of the churches we've worked with, there's been cases of uh, you know, the pastor being attacked with an axe. This is Queensland I'm talking about. Mm-hmm. We've had people tell us that somebody you know, had a breakdown and drove their car through the wall into the church. So the challenge we've got now, it's not just looking at the worst case, you know, fundamentalist. 
it, we also need to look at those people who break and will take that out on their community because if they perpetrate violence, people get hurt. It doesn't matter the motive. So to your point, a broad range, securing the facility, keep training people and being prepared is an integrated approach. So presilience, the thought that you'll have a whole lot of preparation in place that might deter any sort of attack. Let me come to that other side of the balance, the response. Um, I mean, and we might not get into this because I'm sure there's lots of responses that you can do. And uh, as a martial arts trained, um, uh, effective uh, operator here, you might have your own thoughts. But for the ordinary church, without someone who's got a black belt, a seventh dan in uh, in an area of martial arts, is there an effective way to respond if you happen to come under this sort of attack? There are, there are lots of different effective ways. So if we look at, for example, the federal government guidance around responding to an active armed offender, it covers escape hard and tell, but under escape and hard, there's fight if necessary. So from your perspective... The only time you should be thinking that you would engage in any sort of force is the protection and saving of life. If somebody was conducting something that was hurting other people, they need to be stopped. So the more preparation you can put into how do we stop somebody, the easier it is. These things can range from, hey, let's just have uh, flexible cable ties, for example. So we have a way of restraining somebody. If we haven't thought about that and we've got to hold this person down until the authorities arrive – it gets worse, and we saw that happen just with the case the other night. But equally, there's tactics such as swarming, where if you get five or ten people that all tackle somebody at the same time, they don't have the ability to shoot or stab all of those people at the same time. There are challenges with that. That can lead to positional asphyxia for the person that you swarm. But practically, if that person was stabbing somebody or about to shoot somebody, you know, the, the sooner you can stop them and immobilize them, the better off we are. Is it the case, you think, as you're observing Aussies uh, and perhaps uh, your understanding of what happens in Christian churches, uh, do churches often have people who are courageous enough to be involved in that swarming? If they saw that there was something unfolding, would they jump on the attacker? So, So my experience has been that in almost every single community we've worked with, regardless of whether they were Christian or Jewish sites, there are always people that are willing to stand up and protect others. We, 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 we generally refer to them as sheepdog, sheepdogs. And you want to train your sheepdogs to have the tools they need to protect everyone else. And it's fascinating that that should extend to leadership too, and leadership should be driving that from the front, primarily because we've changed the, the, the way attacks happen has changed. The old idea of thinking we are most vulnerable at a, at a service, for example, when the majority of people are there, it, it is still valid. And we saw by, the, by, the, by this recent attack that that was the timing picked because for terrorists, they want to influence an audience. But for a mentally unstable person, you know, they may specifically pick somebody in the community to focus on. And the attack may not happen at the church. So we do need to go, those who have a public face, at the very least need to train in some level of vigilance and the most basic level of personal safety. They don't have to be a black belt, but knowing what to do if somebody's threatening you, somebody's in your face, or somebody's following you is critically important, not just during a service, but also in between. Let's squeeze a quick call in before news. Uh, Peter is in Armadale. Peter, uh, what are your thoughts, Peter? Welcome. Uh, hi. Yeah, um, to be honest, I think a lot of it is overreaction. And I mean, I... I look at um, I look at the Bible, and I look at when Jesus sends out his disciples. And he said, "Don't take anything with you. Don't take a sword. Don't take anything." Um, also, when he's being arrested, he's he's offering a peaceful alternative and said, "Look, what? It, put your swords away. I'm not leading a revolution." Um, and realistically, as well, we're only told to be uh, wearing the uh, breastplate of righteousness or the armor of God. And the sword of spirit. That's all we need. And I don't think we actually, I think if we, when it comes down to it, if something happens, we should be willing to just fully rely on God to, to work with that. Peter, an interesting aspect, and just to add one dimension to that, uh, in that Luke 22, verse 36, Jesus actually said 
uh, to his disciples. Uh, he said, but now he that has a purse, let, it, let him take it, and likewise his scrip, and he that has no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. Uh, clearly that was a uh, defense uh, challenge there that Jesus put to his own disciples. Uh, not that he would need protection because Jesus, the Son of God, but that his discipleships may be thoughtful about their own protection there. Gav, before we take another call, let me come back to the one we took just before the news. And uh, that was uh, from a caller who was interested in whether belief is enough in your preparation. Peter in Armadale called through. And reflecting too on Jesus here, uh, how do you respond? Belief, is that enough uh, from a Jewish and from a Christian perspective and, uh, and, and whether that's enough in Australia today? Sure. Um, it's, it's actually a tough question because you're talking about something intangible in terms of people's belief. My personal view is that I would rather have strong faith and strong preparation and not make them separate nor aligned parts because I feel they're exactly the same. I feel from my perspective, God has given me the ability to do all the things I do and gain all the knowledge I've got. And equally, it's my responsibility to share it with those who need it. But it, I feel, and, and I'll share a little anecdote with, with the listeners. Uh, having grown up in South Africa, significantly different crime regime, uh, at about 21 years old, I was a professional bodyguard. I was actually a world champion in my style of martial arts. I was probably top of my game. Got a call one night. It was my mother. She was on the way to hospital, my stepfather had just been shot in the head in an attempted robbery and died shortly thereafter. Wow. It was a wake-up moment for me where I realized it actually doesn't matter how good I am because if I can't be there for the people who need me at the time they need me, it's irrelevant. And it's changed fundamentally the way I run my businesses and what I do. We're about empowering others because in all likelihood, the expert isn't going to be there when you need them. So I would rather say, have the knowledge, have the skills, and maybe you never have to use them. And the research has certainly shown that having the knowledge and the skills creates a great deterrent value, which makes it less likely that you will have to use them in the first place. I did mention too Luke chapter 22 and verse 36, uh, where Jesus actually encouraged his disciples uh, to buy a sword. Uh, then, of course, you might recall in Matthew 26, Jesus responded when Peter used his sword to cut off the ear of a servant of the high priest. And Jesus said, uh, you know, put that sword away, um, basically saying, um, for all that take the sword shall perish with the sword. So there's all sorts of dimensions in here. And we don't want to be ignorant of those, but do want to draw attention to the fact that, uh, that defense is not a wrong thing. Uh, but there are going to be all sorts of different ways that you might respond. And just quickly, too, um, around the concept of there may be those who are courageous enough to jump on to an offender if they are coming to attack. But there are others who will be gifted uh, to to perhaps deal with the aftermath of that um, uh, nursing uh, skills and those sorts of things or being able to prepare for such a thing. Everyone's got their own gift to bring to the table here, Gav. I agree 100 percent. And if you're feeling some level of cognitive dissonance or frustration with some of the topics we're talking about and you feel you would not be somebody who is comfortable to get involved in stopping an attack if it happened, Go and learn first aid or look at the skills that you've got that could contribute, for example, planning or organizing, fundraising. All of these things become really important in being able to get a robust, proactive, ready culture. And, and I, I use the term culture not lightly. We want a culture of being prepared but not paranoid, ready but not afraid. And those things don't happen on their own. They have to be built, developed and nurtured. We're taking calls. If you'd like to contribute, 1-800-316-316. Let's take another call. Rick is in Queensland. Hey, Rick, welcome along. How you going, brother? How's life? Doing good. Rick, what are your thoughts? My question is, I'm, I'm an agnostic. I don't have a God. I'm an Aboriginal. But if I'm walking past a church or a gathering and someone is doing someone harm with a knife, right? Under Queensland law, if I step in, remove a knife from that person, and he gets hurt in the process, how much legal ramification is going to come back on me for doing that? What I'm a little bit confused. Because the other day a bloke fought a bloke off with a bollard, they're giving him Australian citizenship. 
if you've got a history of martial arts in Australia, years ago they were able to say, oh, now you're a professional, you're not allowed to use that on the unprofessional. Rick, you are raising some really good questions. Um, let me ask you, Gav, uh, just to respond to Rick here. Hey, Rick, thanks for thanks for sharing. Um, so, pre- right, so first caveat, I'm not a lawyer. I'm a criminologist and security expert, but I can share with you some of the insights because the use of force is an area of expertise for me. So practically, the law compares you to people like you based on something called the reasonable person or reasonable man test. So, for example... Me, as a lifelong martial artist, if I responded, I would be compared to the response of a lifelong martial artist. It's significantly different to a 50-kilogram housewife, for example, who might respond with no training. Now, the, I'm a 47 kilo, and I've done a lot of martial arts. So, so, so you might be sitting on the same page as me. So the exactly, cha- the same spot you are. So, so the challenge we've got then is really there's two reasons we could use force for self-defense of ourselves or others. So if somebody was harming someone else, we need to respond with what's deemed proportionate or reasonable force. And the challenge with that is in a dynamic situation, it's exceptionally difficult to figure out when to stop, when to start, and how much to use and how much not to use. To your point about the Bondi attack, when you saw a civilian using a bollard you know, and being celebrated for that, I, I think that's wonderful. It's a great example of courage. But practically... For me, is you've got a personal choice to make, and that choice has to be made very, very quickly when you see violence happening. So if, if it's not under the justification of self-defense, in other words, if I don't do this, I will get hurt, or the justification of necessity. If I don't act now, there will be a terrible outcome that is significantly worse than the outcome that would have happened. So if, if you're comfortable with those two pieces, generally it will be defendable. If you're not comfortable with the protection of yourself or protection of others as the justification, and there's a very fine line, you know, to your point, if you're able to disarm the guy, get the knife off him, take him down, you've got to, you've got to be able to then restrain and not hurt him further. Otherwise, that becomes assault. So it is, it is a tough area to look at. My general guidance there, though, is I would always rather people were alive to defend themselves and tell their side of the story. And I would strongly suggest that rather you pay legal fees than hospital fees. But that is a personal choice. Rick, I want to thank you so much for calling in. A valuable contribution to make uh, from someone uh, who describes himself as an agnostic and uh, as an Indigenous man. Rick, thank you so much for your call. Just before we move on to uh, the next caller, um, the Frenchman who took up the bollard, he was doing that in defence. Technically, that bollard became in his hands, a weapon. So we had weapon against weapon there, as we can think of the attacker going up the escalator. Um, Anything can become a weapon, can't it? So it's an interesting discussion. Uh, In my book, I actually go into a lot of detail on the difference between an improvised weapon and a defensive tool. So an improvised weapon is something you pick up with intent to use as a weapon that is weapon-like. A defensive tool is something that somebody who's being attacked or defending somebody would use. And in many cases, they're the same thing. One is just carried for intent, one is not carried, one is picked up and utilized. But for all your listeners, if somebody was attacking you with a knife or a weapon, why would you defend yourself unarmed? So finding objects in your environment, planting objects in your environment, and having things that you could use can be a significant force multiplier. For example, when looking at active arm offender attacks in the U.S., um, some of the schools were training school kids to, th- to collectively throw their chairs at the attacker. So you imagine you storm a room and there's 30 little kids throwing chairs at you. You don't have to stop the attacker. It's to buy enough time to either get away or lock the door. And what's interesting enough, if we look at a lot of these attacks, one of the single biggest life-saving actions in active arm offender attacks is locking doors. <laughs> Uh, let me just be provocative here, and I know uh, this might tread on a toe or two. Um, Jesus actually took time uh, to fashion a weapon. Um, for listeners, you'll know that um, that Jesus made a whip, um, and he actually used that as he cleansed the temple. Uh, John chapter 2, verses 14 through 16. So when we're talking about Jesus, when we're talking about faith, we're talking about belief, and we're talking about defense, 
or how weapons might be used. Um, that's not necessarily something that we can't align to a biblical foundation there. And there might be those who'd like to argue with that. But that's that's fine as well. Uh, I don't want to be, uh, you know, uh, uh, definitive in uh, in the way we're talking about this. But we are taking calls and your opportunity. Let's talk to Scott, who's in Point Cook. Hey, Scott, welcome along. Good morning, gentlemen. How are you? Very well, Scott. What are your thoughts? Yeah, it's been a very interesting conversation. <clears throat> I have a, a 20-year background in martial arts myself. And what Gavin said about faith and preparation... I see the two coming together and that I, I have faith in my preparation. So in the event that something like this occurs, that the, you can have a harmonious resolution. And by harmonious, I mean both for assailant, perpetrator, or you, whatever you want to call them, and the, uh, the object of his attack. So not just a, a ground and pound situation, but you nullify the threat, so then you, you can deal with it. Uh, part of my journey in the martial arts... I spent a lot of time helping my instructor run his children's classes because it wasn't just a journey for me to learn myself, but I felt it was beholding on me to share these things with children, and we were working with children from six years old up to 16. And to see them grow in confidence and they come on the mats and they start learning things, children that would, uh, would scared of their own shadows and uh, different children progress at different rates, and you could see them develop along that journey. And one story that comes to mind in particular, a parent brought his children along the classes because his older daughter, well, she was at primary school, probably about 10, 11, was getting unwanted attention at school. So he thought, I'll bring her along. And not armor so she could beat them up, but just a bit of confidence. Within a few months, he came along one night he had some great news. He said that she was no longer getting the unwanted attention. And it's like, okay, that's, that's interesting. Scott, that's you're interesting. raising some really great points here. And, uh, and I'm going to get Gav to comment, but uh, there could be all sorts of reasons why, as a Christian or as someone who holds to a religious foundation, and uh, given that our special guest here is Jewish, uh, there's all sorts of reasons why you might want to defend yourself and why you might be looking to your own faith uh, for foundations around why that ought to happen. What are your thoughts here for Scott? Um, Scott, thanks for sharing, uh, f- fellow sheepdog, and your commitment to protecting others and aligning your skill set to making things better is commendable. So thank you, and thank you for calling in. Um I, I agree wholeheartedly, and I think part of the challenge also is we shouldn't fall into the trap of thinking about defense in a binary way. It's a life skill. The ability for a female, for example, and if we look at violence perpetrated against females, sexual assault, it's a it's an epidemic, actually. So learning how to protect yourself and others, for me, is a life skill that we should we should actually be passing on to everybody, but practically... You know, it's good to know that there's people like you out there in the community that are volunteering your skills to keep things safe. Scott in Point Cork, thank you so much for your contribution. 1-800-316-316, although time is short. Let me just, maybe it's drawing a long bow here, but if you are gifted to be able to defend others, could this even be a expression of love to loving your neighbour, to keeping others uh, safe is that something you can think of absolutely and you know I've, I, i'm humbled so often by the bravery of others and the commitment of others and most of them are unsung heroes if you look at the very best security or protection job it's a job where nothing goes wrong and when you don't hear about the things when nothing goes wrong you only hear about the things when things go wrong so there are many unsung heroes out there that are spending a lot of time volunteering giving their time giving their effort giving their energy to ensure others can pray safely and others can be the best version of themselves. And uh, from my perspective, it's a wonderful sacrifice and a wonderful way to give back. Interesting, isn't it? As my mind wanders off uh, to the attack that happened in Bondi Junction and the Prime Minister's acknowledgement of the bravery of the Frenchman with the bollard and even offering, uh, you can stay as long as you like. Now, Prime Ministers don't say those things lightly, but what he is doing there, my suspicion is, is he's, he's trying to uh, assert what a good Australian value would be. 
to protect and defend uh, the innocent from someone who might be attacking. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of dimensions here. We're talking about a faith and religious dimension that happens in churches, but there is something that clearly from the very top of our country, uh, the Prime Minister wants those sorts of values to be something that we consider are good values. So I think it's important, while we focused on sort of churches, we've got to be thinking schools, you've got to be thinking any sort of faith-based site where somebody could target that site for symbolic reasoning or might have a personal grievance is important for us to consider. And the way you protect, for example, a church is a little bit different to the way you protect a school, which is a little bit different to the way you protect a gathering. So practically, what we want to do is get some good principles in place. And Neil, I know we started having a little discussion offline about what does good actually look like. And I think just for your listeners, let's just take a minute to look at what good would look like. And I'll caveat that with saying it should be customized to your site, your budget, your requirements, your specifications, and most importantly, your threat exposure. A rural community, as we discussed earlier, Neil, will have totally different threats. They'll know every single person who comes there. Um, that it, it, it's a different picture and a different approach. An urban church, for example, or a school that has 2,000 people and by definition of that amount of people, is not going to know every parent, is not going to know every person who comes to site, has to have a very different approach. So it comes back in risk speak, we talk about risk appetite. How much appetite have you got to expose yourself to risk? We then talk about tolerance. What would break you? And this is an interesting one because very often an attack on a religious site creates unity. And it's, 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 a, it's a weird thing to observe, but hardship brings people together my firm view is I'd much rather that people never have to experience that. And if we look at it in other settings, for example, a retail setting like Bondi, it makes people not want to go there. So what does good look like? Let's, let's do the one minute quick snapshot. Good. Okay. So we want motivated individuals that are trained and prepared, who understand how to spot suspicious behavior, understand how to de-escalate suspicious behavior, because our first option should always be de-escalation and trying to make sure nothing bad happens. We need experts within your own group. And when I say experts, they don't have to be degreed, law enforcement, military experts. They need to be people who've put themselves forward to learn how to plan, prepare, and respond and lead others through that process. Once they know how to identify and de-escalate, then we have to look at what do we do if something goes wrong? And that's normally the basis of looking at what are the likely things to go wrong. Um, most structures, because it's legislated, will have a safety committee or a group that looks at slip strips, falls, chemical storage, etc. It's a logical extension to make that a safety and security committee, for example, or even just the risk committee for your site to determine your appetite and your tolerance. And you might have to then go on a bit of a fundraising campaign to, to then look at the next piece, which is it costs a bit of money to train your people. It also costs a bit of money to secure your site. We don't have to go crazy with that. But if you think of the, the most common attacks, and all you have to do is look at the Australian New Zealand Counterterrorism Committee's guidance on managing the risks of crowded places. There's some really good tools out there that are free. And we can start looking at, you know, okay, is it cameras? Is it bollards? Is it uh, screens? Is it locked lock doors? Um, primarily for a response, we want two real sets of skill sets. We want to be able to get out or lock in. And we need to make sure we have both options available and know when to use which. Those need to be tested and practiced. There's also the challenge of cyber because a lot of risks we face now are virtual risks that then turn into physical risks or physical risks that turn into reputational risks because of cyber. So we need to integrate and plan for that too, which leads to what what we've spoken about now is what happens on the ground, sort of what the people do and what you do with your site. We should be looking at what your leadership and management do, which is also developing robust emergency management plans, and also a crisis management capability. The crisis management capability is there for when you get overwhelmed. Well, just listening to that last 60 seconds is worth a re-listen to the podcast when this is up a little later on this afternoon. Let's squeeze in just one more call. Uh, Richard's been waiting patiently. Hey, Richard, in Austinville, uh, welcome along. Uh, hey, young guys. Um, are you talking just about a public domestic incident or are you talking about defence of your country as well? 
you know what, that takes us into a whole new dimension, doesn't it? Because uh, Christians have sometimes taken a pacifist view and not uh, been involved in the defence. Um, uh, oftentimes churches will leave that uh, to each individual to make that sort of assessment. But my assumption would be that uh, when we're talking about defence and, uh, you know, in, in these sort of circumstances, yes, I'm sure it does uh, relate to how we might defend our nation as well. Richard, does that does that answer your question? But uh, Gav, did you want to add anything to that? Uh, I would say, Richard, if you are a sheepdog and a warrior, and that's what your makeup is, it would make sense that you'd want to either serve in defence of your country or in law enforcement or some sort of vocation that would enable you to enact that sheepdog mindset. Mm-hmm. Richard, thank you so much for your call and I'm going to have to put a a line under the calls and uh, apologies to those who were not able to have their say today but I do want to, as I always do, create an opportunity for you to connect with our special guest, um, Dr Gavriel Schneider. We can call him Gav. Uh, He's the author of a book. You might want to jot this down. Can I See Your Hands? A Guide to Situational Awareness, Personal Risk Management, Resilience and Security. There is a website you can connect with Gav. It's risk2, that's risk, the number two, solution.com. Uh, Gav, you also have some other dimensions. Um, the r2s.academy, uh, no doubt that's a training uh, a site, and also presilience.edu.au, uh, an education ability to be prepared and resilient. So that's a presilience is the, the combination of those two words. Uh, Gav, uh, just before I let you go, your perception, are we headed for deeper and more challenging times ahead? Or do you think that this might be just a glitch that we've seen this past week? Uh, just a, a quick perception on what might be ahead? Sure. Um, I guess after doing this for more than 25 years and seeing many different iterations from 9-11 through to the Iraq wars, as well as you know this recent period, I, I would say with a fair amount of confidence, this is the start of, of a pretty bad run we're facing. We need to remember for three years, we locked people away during COVID. We, um, we degraded our social coping skills. We degraded our social cohesion skills. And we haven't really done much to repair it post-COVID. We've just got back to work and pretended nothing happened. We're also hyper-connected now. We see what happens all over the world as though it's happening to us all the time, which creates a significant amount of anxiety. On top of that, and, and I, I do apologize to the listeners, this sounds like a bad news rant, but I feel I have to give you the real picture from all the way I see it. If we also look over the last two decades, we've popularized violence in a way that has never been popularized before. Violent video games, first-person shooter TV games, violence on TV. If you are a well-adjusted human with a good social support network, you would view those as simply entertainment and they would be escapism. If you're somebody with a mental health issue or somebody with a grievance, those become triggers for you and perpetrate violence as something that is to be celebrated. So with all of those things combined, you know, I would love to say that you know, Australia is an island. We're far away from everyone. Cyber is the only thing we have to worry about because it knows no borders. It's just not true. If we look at the spate of incidents, whether it's you know, police shootings in central Queensland whether it's Bondi, whether it's church attacks. Uh, I can speak for the Jewish community. We've seen a significant increase in not just anti-Semitic activity, but actual attacks and threats carrying out just here in Queensland, never mind around the country. So looking at all of that, I would say we, we, we really do need to be prepared. And the more prepared you are, the less likely something bad will happen. Let's make sure we do what we can so that you're not in that position. I was in that horrible night when... I rushed to the hospital after a family member was shot in the head and there was nothing I could do post-incident. Well, Dr. Gavriel Schneider. Gav, thank you so much for sharing your insights with us today on 2020. Thank you for having me. Thanks for taking time to listen to this audio on demand from Vision Christian Media. To find out more about us, go to vision.org.au.